Okay. Um, so good morning, good evening, good night, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, thanks for joining today's CNCF webinar. Um, the evolution of cloud orchestration systems for ephemeral to persistent storage. I'm Christy Tan. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to, like, like to welcome our presenter, Boyan Karsnoff, CPO at StorePool. A few housekeeping hey, items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop in your questions and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinars page at cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I'll hand it over to Boyan to kick off today's presentation. Take it away. Thanks, Christy. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name is Boyan Krosnov. I'm the uh, chief of product of a storage company called Storepool. And what we do is uh, very fast and very reliable scale out block storage system. And uh, like you may notice that everyone claims these things, uh, like, uh, but uh, the difference with Storepool is that we actually deliver on them. We don't just claim them. So what we do is a software defined storage system. Software defined storage system. It's API controlled. It's used a lot in um, kind of DevOps and SRE uh, kind of environments. It's strongly associated with uh, new IT as opposed to traditional IT. And we have a, a, a ton of integrations with uh, popular uh, orchestration systems. Uh, Storpool is a CNCF member and it has a uh, Kubernetes CSI uh, driver, which is the, the kind of uh, parts which are relevant to the Kubernetes um, ecosystem. So as I said, um, our product is integrated with a number of uh, cloud orchestration systems, um, OpenStack and CloudStack and Open Nebula and even ONAP and since uh, about a year uh, or less uh, Kubernetes. Um, so we see some patterns of how um, storage or pers persistent storage functionality evolves uh, in these different cloud orchestration systems over time. And uh, in this presentation, I'll, I'll try to uh, give you some kind of correlation between these different um, um, systems, how they evolved over time compared to uh, Kubernetes. So here's my agenda. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, cattle versus pets. And I know it's kind of a, an old and tired uh, topic, uh, but I, I'm sure there are some people uh, in the audience who uh, haven't heard of this uh, concept and uh, it will be interesting for them to understand it. I'm going to talk about the separation of uh, code and storage uh, and some his, uh, historical uh, review of how these things evolved in AWS and in OpenStack and in Kubernetes and, and, and I'm gonna draw some conclusions uh, at the end. So here we go. Uh, so first of all, um, there is concept of uh, pets and cattle and uh, you can think of pets as uh, everything that traditional IT uh, did. Uh, so these are servers or pairs of servers, like highly available pairs of servers, um, which are uh, unique uh, systems. Um, they can uh, never be down. They cannot be automatically redeployed, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, these are kind of um, traditional uh, sysadmins would uh, bring them up based on kind of a written instruction or documentation from say a software vendor. And then these would uh, evolve over time uh, with uh, different versions of the, uh, their software, et cetera, et cetera. Um, versus cattle, where um, you have uh, many uh, identical uh, VMs or containers. Um, and these are um, created based on a uh, recipe. So you can, at any time, you could create uh, more of them, or at any time, you could. Uh, bring um, kind of a, a completely new environment from scratch based on uh, the recipe you have. Um, and uh, cattle, so the, the kind of one of the main differences is that uh, in the cattle concept, uh, no individual VM or container 
uh, is uh, precious to you. You could discard it at any time and you wouldn't lose functionality from, um, from your application. Uh, while in the pets concept, if you lose a server, it's a big deal and uh, it may cause downtime and uh, it, it causes a lot of um, people to um, react to that uh, situation, etc. So, um, so one thing you uh, one thing to understand is that um, persistent storage is not uh, associated only with uh, pets. So. Uh, so uh, traditional IT is pets, modern IT and kind of DevOps and uh, SRE concepts uh, are mostly cattle with some small number of pets. Um, and even cattle need, even some cattle need persistent storage, meaning that because you can uh, bring up another instance of your application, that doesn't mean the application doesn't need uh, storage, right? Uh, and there is still, uh, because this transition to uh, what we call modern IT or new IT um, is taking, is going to take uh, many years. There are still many pets around and um, because of um, say my migrations of applications from physical to virtual machines or for, from virtual machines to containers without significant rewriting uh, of these applications. So, so this causes this uh, kind of um, a decade, per, perhaps more, lag of um, all applications uh, using the newer um, concept of um, everything being deployed based on a recipe. So infrastructure is code and um, de deploying from template and uh, treating every individual VM or container as um, disposable. Right, so, um, in traditional IT, to give you one example, um, code of the application and storage of the application were separated on um, separate um, entities, on, on separate systems. The code would run on, uh, say, application servers, uh, and these would be standard x86 servers, and they would host uh, what, what's called a multi-tier application. So that may have, um, say, a database and um, or a business logic tier, or it may have multiple tiers, uh, say above that, it may have a load balancer, et cetera. And local disks in the servers would be used just for the uh, operating system. Sometimes the, the servers wouldn't even have local disks. And persistence in the in, in traditional IT uh, is achieved using a SAN or a NAS. Uh, and this, these systems provide uh, above all uh, high availability and longevity of data. So whatever happens to an individual um, application server, it doesn't affect the, the availability or um, persistence of, of data in the storage system. Uh, there are always uh, shared systems, meaning uh, uh, one of these, say, uh, SAN systems will be used by multiple applications. And uh, in a lot of cases, the same data may be accessed by multiple servers. Um, uh, and this is in both cases, in the SAN case and in the uh, NAS case. Now, th this concept of a multi-tier application and uh, separating where we run code and where we store data uh, also uh, translates uh, directly into uh, modern IT. So uh, in modern IT, um, with this concept of uh, containers, um, th the main thing we achieve with containers is not um, is not uh, kind of um, separating resources or uh, security isolation between different application components. The main thing we achieve with containers is um, packaging code, packaging the application. Uh, what does that mean? Means that instead of installing the application as uh, a software package on a standard operating system and having to deal with all the uh, kind of uh, continuously changing dependencies in that uh, traditional Linux uh, distribution, like say Red Hat Enterprise Linux. What we do is we take the application, we package it together with all of its dependencies and, and um, we ship it as one whole. So the application and, and all of its dependencies together uh, in the uh, container image. So we get rid of um, uh, dev and RPM and NPM and PIP, uh, et cetera. 
uh, external dependencies which which may change uh, over the life of a particular server and that's the, the main uh, benefit of, of using containers and um, it also um, kubernetes and um, containers uh, give us this concept of packaging whole complex applications so you could have say a, a helm chart which describes a, a whole application which is multiple containers multiple pods um, which we didn't have uh, in traditional IT. So, so bo both of these concepts are new in this uh, new way of, of doing applications, of doing IT. Uh, what's um, changed also is that initially uh, in this um, great new world of uh, everything is going to be a container, persistence or application state uh, was considered to be someone else's problem, right? So Kubernetes didn't didn't have internal mechanisms of how it could do persistence at all. So it was assumed that you have, say, an external SQL database or an external uh, object store or an external filer, uh, a file system, or uh, kind of in a more advanced cases, an external Cassandra cluster. And over time, um, the idea that we could also take um, the, the persistence layer, the storage layer of the application and move it inside Kubernetes was um, widely accepted and now we have uh, persistence um, in Kubernetes um, as well. So it's no longer someone else's problem. So persistence is something, um, if you think the application has several layers and one of these layers is storage, now storage is uh, considered to be uh, part of the whole um, application um, package, uh, you could say, and it runs um, inside on the same nodes where the, the application runs. Right, so um, in historically, this, um, this pattern that uh, a new, uh, say, cloud service or cloud orchestration system starts with the concept that uh, it's going to support only cattle and it's not going to have any form of uh, persistent storage. Um, has uh, been seen a number of times and uh, in Amazon's uh, EBS, uh, sorry, Amazon's AWS service uh, started with um, this concept. So the EC EC2 virtual machines initially only had local storage, which means that um, if the physical host they run on died, they wouldn't preserve data. And then about two years later, Amazon introduced uh, the Elastic Block storage service. Um, so during these two years, uh, adoption of uh, Amazon, um, EC, the Amazon EC2 service was very limited because it didn't su support kind of this external persistent storage uh, layer or, or it only supported uh, external storage in object storage, which means uh, for a lot of applications means rewriting them or uh, something like that. Uh, over time, uh, there were more features added um, to Amazon EBS. So uh, for example, even booting from EBS wasn't uh, a feature in, in the very beginning when, when it was released. Uh, creating snapshots of it, uh, creating, cl creating clones, resizing EBS uh, volumes, etc. These are all features which are added after the initial release of, of the uh, block storage uh, service. Very similar pattern in uh, OpenStack initially released in uh, October of 2010, there was some persistent volumes uh, support added um, into the main project. And that was uh, fairly limited means, uh, meaning it, it had a, a very small number of drivers or a very small number of uh, supported um, different um, storage systems that, that could integrate uh, with OpenStack and then Again, about two years years after the initial release of the OpenStack project, uh, the Cinder service was released, uh, which gave us the ability to have block storage plugins so that multiple vendors, and nowadays it's uh, like um, 20 plus uh, storage vendors have plugins for uh, Cinder, uh, could integrate against um, uh, Cinder or OpenStack and provide uh, API controlled storage services to it. Uh, and again, uh, features were added over time, meaning booting from um, a Cinder volume wasn't there initially, it was added later. 
migration from um, say local storage to cinder or migration between different cinder backends, uh, encryption, resizing of a, a cinder volume uh, offline and later resizing of a cinder volume online, meaning without restarting the virtual machines were all features added later. So uh, conclusion here is it's the same pattern as uh, AWS. The service starts without uh, proper uh, persistence uh, support and later it adds persistence. Uh, and uh, my understanding is it adds persistence because it's required by uh, the users of, uh, of this cloud orchestration system. And in Kubernetes, we had um, exactly the same uh, pattern. So uh, the first public release was in 2014. Um, in 2016, uh, the, the kind of supporting stateful applications became an explicit project goal. Uh, Many Kubernetes uh, kind of, um, there was a public statement saying stateful sets uh, or pet sets as they were called initially uh, are very important to us and we need to support them. There was some persistence volume um, support added into the main project uh, under flex volumes. And then in 20, 2018, which is four years after the initial release, we got to the, the same situation as in um, OpenStack, which is a pluggable uh, architecture for uh, storage backends, uh, so that um, multiple storage vendors like Storpool could provide uh, an integrated uh, storage solution uh, with Kubernetes. Um, similarly to OpenStack and uh, AWS, there were there were and still are features being added uh, over time, uh, such as support for row block instead of uh, just file system, support for cloning, for snapshots, for resizing, etc. cetera. Uh, so, so these are uh, features which, um, let's say, uh, OpenStack and Cinder had discovered are kind of uh, important for everyone. And uh, if you have an API control storage system, you should have these features. And in Kubernetes and CSI, uh, we are again starting from scratch and adding these features one by one. Um, so here's my conclusion. Um, uh, all cloud orchestration systems, actually not all, but there are examples where uh, uh, a specific goal of the cloud orchestration system like in CloudSat was to support legacy applications, right? Was to support, um, I have a, a, a VM in VMware, I wanna be able to take that and move it to a cloud stack KVM environment and for it to work. Uh, in these cases, they didn't start with just ephemeral, uh, but in a lot of cases when a new cloud service or a new cloud orchestration system like OpenStack or Kubernetes is started. It starts with this romantic view of a pure world where every component of every uh, application is uh, stateless uh, and it doesn't need any storage. Um, and then two to four years later, reality sets in and um, we figure out that even some cattle uh, need persistent storage uh, and that there are still many pets that uh, will live uh, for uh, another de decade, 10 years or more because of uh, kind of this lag of adoption of the new uh, operational model of uh, everything like, um, which is promoted by the Kubernetes community, which is that uh, every application needs to be able to be rebuilt from scratch uh, using some form of recipe, right? Uh, so until we um, get all applications converted to this new operational model, there will still be many pets and pay, pets definitely need uh, persistent storage. Um, so for these two use cases, we need uh, persistent storage. So every uh, Kubernetes deployment needs storage. Um, and uh, you also actually need a, a good solution for that because it's kind of a, a very important and integral, integral part of your private cloud or public cloud if you want to do these kinds of services. And um, what we do at Storpool is uh, provide uh, this kind of solution. So uh, a very good persistent storage solution uh, for Kubernetes. So th these were my, uh, this is the end of my presentation. And uh, I think we'll open to questions now. Great, thanks Boyan. Uh, a friendly reminder to anyone uh, listening in here, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, um, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen here. We'd love for you to submit your question through there. Um, looks like we, are, we have had a few already come through, so I'll just go ahead and start them. 
Uh, the first one is why uh, did Storepool decide to integrate with Kubernetes? Yeah, so um, as, as, was, uh, as I said in the beginning, we um, we already have a number of integration in, integrations in this um, kind of open infrastructure uh, ecosystem, which is OpenStack, CloudStack, etc. Um, and uh, we recognized uh, Kubernetes as uh, essentially the winner in container orchestration. And um, if we had to choose between uh, the different container orchestrations and which one we should have an integration with, uh, Kubernetes was the obvious choice at the time we, uh, we did it. Um, and uh, we recognize uh, kind of containers and Kubernetes as a very important use case. And we were always, uh, like our product was always strongly associated with uh, new IT or modern IT. And adding support for Kubernetes was kind of very natural for us. It, it wasn't some alien concepts that, that we had to add to the product. It's, it's just um, another um, API integration with an orchestration system for us. Okay, great. Um, our next question is, uh, what is the typical customer um, using store pool and why would they uh, choose it? Yeah, so um, store pool has, uh, let, let's first talk about in um, principle, not just in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, store pool has um, many customers who are service providers, perhaps like 70% of our customers are service providers of some sort which is um, hosting companies, public cloud uh, operators, uh, managed service providers, et cetera. And then the smaller fraction of our customers are uh, private clouds, which uh, operate in this uh, modern IT or new IT uh, DevOps um, concept. So in these private clouds, um, they could be used for hosting a production application, or they could, in some other customers, they're used for uh, kind of uh, development or continuous integration, testing, uh, building, etc. cetera. Uh, and in both cases, um, it, these are dynamic environments, meaning many um, over the course of say a day, many uh, volumes and snapshots are created, deleted, resized, uh, attached to uh, virtual machines, detached from virtual machines, et cetera, et cetera. Because, the, uh, because it's a, like a dynamic DevOps style uh, environment. Um, why would I choose Torpool? Uh, in addition to being uh, like uh, a proper API controlled uh, storage system, uh, Torpool is uh, very strong in um, reliability availability. So especially if you're looking to do a production uh, application on a private cloud environment, or if you, if you want to do a, a service provider like a managed service provider, for example, so availability and uh, performance are uh, some of our kind of strongest um, features of the product from day one. Um, yeah. Great, okay, we had another question just come in. Um, what is your view about handing stateful services in Kubernetes using Helm charts versus operators? Yeah, so operators obviously gives you, um, if you write an operator, it gives you more uh, control uh, over these uh, stateful services, right? So, um, meaning you could, um, in the operator, you could de define a lot of uh, application specific uh, logic, uh, right? So, Helm charts is a more uh, generic. A tool, so it's like a hammer, and you could apply that to to running stateful services. But um, if you want like um, the the best possible behavior of a say a database cluster, um, the best way to do that would be with an operator instead of uh, the generic uh, way with Helm charts. I think. Okay. Um... We're going to go ahead and give uh, just a minute here for any last minute questions to come through. Um, while we're waiting, oh, we just had another one come through. Perfect timing. <laughs> uh, what is your opinion about using CSI as a way of handling storage in Kubernetes? Mm, so CSI, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, so CSI, uh, 
promises to, to give you like a unified uh, interface to all uh, persistent storage uh, systems, and um, which is twofold. One, um, it defines um, like a set of APIs um, that, that are common to um, all storage, right? Uh, such as creating a volume, deleting a volume, resizing a volume, etc. Uh, creating a snapshot, uh, creating a clone, etc. And on the other hand, um, CSI, because it's like a, a, a fairly stable interface, uh, has a number, so tens of different um, storage providers uh, behind it. So if you are, um, as an application developer, uh, remember I mentioned about um, packaging whole complex applications is something unique uh, in this new uh, Kubernetes and containers uh, ecosystem. This is something we didn't have in traditional IT. So once you have written, like, once you have packaged your application, you could deploy that on uh, different infrastructure regardless of who the storage vendor is. So you, you don't care if it's uh, Dell EMC behind or if it's uh, Storpool or if it's one of these newer like, container specific uh, storage solutions, right? Um, so th th this gives you a lot of uh, kind of um, strength amplification. Once you package your application, you could deploy that, um, say with minimal, minimal modification, you could deploy that on, on different infrastructure. And you could achieve that uh, because of CSI, because um, CSI has tens of different storage plugins behind, and it's uh, some complexity that's, that's hidden from you as a, a user of Kubernetes. Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, uh, Boyan, are you, is Storpool going to be at um, KubeCon North America? Um, where are some other ways that people can engage with you? So uh, I, I don't think we're going to be at uh, KubeCon. Uh, and, uh, drop us an email at info at uh, storpool.com uh, and uh, we'll, we'll take the conversation forward. Okay, great. Well, thank you again so much for a great presentation. Um, thank you to everyone who attended today. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, a friendly reminder that the recording and the slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinars page. That's cncf.io slash webinars. Um, we look forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar and uh, stay safe out there. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye.